Okay, this, uh, this is a nice review of present value. Uh, if you don't already have this uh, under your belt, then you might want to sit through this. If, if you already know the present value, if you've seen it just so many times, you say, I can't deal with discounting cash flows one more time. I get it, I get it. Then go ahead, move on. You're not going to miss much here. You might want to stick around for my three laws of cash flow and then head out, though. But let's have a look at what they are. I'm going to start with that. And one of them, the first one, sooner cash flows are worth more. That's the whole essence of the time value of money, is that if I get money sooner rather than later, it's worth more to me. If I get $100 today, I have a choice. $100 today or $100 a year from now. I'll take the 100 today because I can invest that 100 today, and in a year from now, it'll be worth more than the 100 I'll get a year from now. So we always want to collect our money as fast as we can, which means we want to pay our bills as late as possible, right? So sooner money... The sooner cash flows are worth more. Once we get into the chapter, we get uh, past uh, screening and we start looking at preferences, the other two become more important. Larger cash flows are worth more. Well, that makes sense, right? A project that provides larger cash flows is worth more than one that provides smaller cash flows. Combine the two together. One that provides larger cash flows sooner. So you may have two projects that both provide large cash flows, but one will provide it sooner. Well, then that one's worth more. So sooner cash flows are worth more, larger cash flows are worth more, and one of the less known ones, but probably the most important ones for assessing uh, which projects you want to take that have been approved is less risky cash flows are worth more. So you may end up with two projects that are identical in terms of net present value, but one of them will be less risky in terms of cash flow. That one will be worth more. And we'll see how we deal with the difference in risk when we get to it. But these three rules, the rules of cash flow, rules of finance, rules of valuation, these you want to remember for the rest of your life. If you can remember these, you can value uh, any asset. You can value any stream of cash flows, understanding the time value, the size value, and the risk value of cash flow. All right. Let's get right into uh, uh, present value. And I'm going to assume you've never seen it before. So I'm going to walk you through it nice and easy. If you've seen it before, this is a nice review to bring you up to speed. But let's say we have a timeline, and this is, represents one year, and we have $100 today. And the interest rate in the marketplace is 2%. So the question is, well, what am I going to have after a year? So what we want to do is uh, accomplish a few things here. Let's put some names on these, on these terminals here. The money we have today, we'll call it, this, the value of this money, we'll call it the present value. Why? Because we're in the present and the value is 100 bucks. We'll call it the present value. 100 invested at a, a certain interest rate will grow to something, to some value in the future. So we call it a future value. So we can see that 100 multiplied by 1.02 it's just the interest rate on top of the 100, uh, grows to $102. So this is easy enough, right? Uh, the 2% is our R right here. So we can algebraically write it out that the future value uh, uh, is equal to the present value multiplied by 1 plus R, R being the interest rate. That's simple enough. Algebraically, we can manipulate that. Now, if we think of FV as a variable, PV as a variable, and in brackets, 1 plus R as a variable, if we divide both sides by 1 plus R, we can cancel out 1 plus R here, and we'll end up with PV, present value, equals future value, divided by 1 plus R. Um, the book uh, sort of takes a different tack. It doesn't do fractions in this sort of sense. It doesn't uh, say FV divided by. But... Note, 1 divided by 1 plus r is the same as 1 plus r to the negative 1. So you can also write it as the present value equals the future value in brackets 1 plus r to the negative 1, because 1 plus r to the negative 1 is 1 over 1 plus r. So you can write it out whichever way you want. I personally don't like putting the negative signs in. I like to see exactly where it's going. That's just my preference. Other people prefer it all on one line. That's their preference, whatever way you like. So this was easy. One period. What happens if it's two years? Can we, can we 
bring this forward and generalize this to any period of time that we want. This is just a one period calculation. What if it were 19 years? What if it were 12? What if it were 93 years with semi-annual compounding? Well, now we, this, this breaks down, right? We don't want to calculate 93 times. So let's just look at a two year. In our first example, we had a present value of 100 and it grew to 102 within one year. Well, if the interest rate is 2%, that 102 will then grow at 102 times, the same 1.02 to 10404 by the end of the second year. So this is nothing more than one. We can skip the middle calculation, put it into one calculation by saying it's $100 times 1.02 squared. Why? Because we're multiplying it by 100 by 102 and then by 102 again, 1.02 again. So it's just 102 squared. So if we say that the number of periods I'm not going to say years, because if this were semi-annual compounding, notice that we would have four periods in here. And R would now be 1% in each period, representing 2% for the year. I'm jumping ahead, but, um, you know, it's always nice to see where we're going, right? So our N in this case is 2 for two periods. And that's what goes into the uh, power term of the 1 plus R term. So our future value over here is equal to our present value, our $100, multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate to the power n, n being the number of periods of which we're compounding. Again, we can divide each side by 1 plus r to the n. We'll get the present value, because most of the time we're trying to figure out what our present value is, right? Present value equals the future value divided by 1 plus r to the power n, or if you like it all on one line, it's future value times 1 plus r to the negative n, keeping in mind that and all this means here is this. These are identical. So we can, uh, uh, we can calculate our present value because here's the thing. Often when we're assessing uh, the, the desirability of a project, we know or we at least can estimate what our future cash flows are. So we know, may know in five years we'll get a big payoff. But what's that worth today? Because today we have to part with some money to make that investment. And if it provides that cash flow then, we want to know what it's worth. So we'll most, most of the time, we'll be trying to find the present value of a project. So let's put a little vocabulary to uh, what we've done so far. If we start with present value, we compound to get to future value. So present value working forwards to future value requires compounding. And compounding is 1 plus r to the n. If we start with future value and we're trying to get to present value, that is called discounting. And discounting is 1 over 1 plus r to the n or 1 plus r to the negative n. And when we discount, we need R. We need what's called a discount rate. When we're moving forward, we call it an interest rate. When we're moving backwards, we call it a discount rate. It could be the same number. Very rarely is it the same number. Usually you can save money and bring money forward at one rate, but to, but to bring it backwards, usually the rate is higher. Uh, so that your discount rate typically is higher than what your savings rate is typically. Uh, and the discount rate that we will use will be the weighted average cost of capital. When we get to that section in the chapter, I'll, I'm not, we're not going to derive the weighted average cost of capital, but I'll explain to you why we use each one of these words. So that you'll say, oh, I get it. I know why it's weighted and average and why it's called cost. I get it now. Okay, so there we go. Well, <clears throat> now that we understand present value, future value, let's apply some of this. So let's look at uh, an annuity. An annuity is something that we can buy that provides a steady stream of cash flows over its life. So, for instance, how much would we pay for this annuity? This annuity pays a dollar at the end of the first year, at the end of the second, at the end of the third, and at the end of the fourth. So it pays a dollar at the end of each year. Well, let's work backwards. What's a dollar worth today? Remember, future value uh, or present value is future value divided by 1 plus r. Well, the future value we know is 1. So we have 1 in every case. So the first dollar is 1 divided by 1 plus r because it's only one period. 
The second dollar is discounted 1 over 1 plus r squared. Well, we don't know what r is, but we're just doing a, a more of a, a generalized uh, um, formula to see if we can come up with an easier way rather than doing it four times, right? The third dollar is 1 over 1 plus r cubed, and the fourth dollar we bring back four periods, 1 over 1 plus r to the 4. We can do all of this. We know that. We know how to bring $1 back one period. We know how to bring $1 back two periods, etc. So the present value is simply just the sum of all those ones, of, of 1 divided by this, 1 divided by that, 1 divided plus, and then finally plus that. But what if it were 14 years and these were monthly cash flows? We don't want to do 168 calculations. There's got to be an easier way. Well, there is. And this is what it looks like. Now, I know that looks messy, but that's what it looks like. But follow me on this, and you'll see that it's really not that messy. What is this term over here? 1 divided by 1 plus r to the n. Well, how many periods do we have? 1 divided by 1 plus r to the n. Notice it's this last term over here. It's the last term in the series that's up here. So all this is is just this last number here. That's all that represents. And then we just take 1 minus this number and divide it just by the interest rate. So if you can remember the last term in the series, it's 1 over 1 plus r to the n. Just put a 1 minus in front of it and divide it by r. There's the present value. If you don't like the 1 over 1 plus r to the n, you can use the 1 plus r to the negative n, which is the same thing, over r. Now, here's the thing. This is per dollar. This is per $1. So what we need to do, well, what if this, instead of being $1, what if this was $100? What if each of these were $100? Well, this just tells us what $1 is. You can't just change the 1 to 100 in here. That doesn't work. What you do at this point is you take this whole thing and you multiply it by the value of the payment. And that assumes equal payments. So we would multiply. Whatever we get in here is the present value of a, of a $1 stream of cash flows for n periods multiplied by how much each payment actually is. So we'd multiply it by 100 to get the present value of not $1, but 100. If this were 3,350, we'd multiply it by 3,350. So let's have a look at an example. Rather than just talking about it abstractly, we'll look at an example. Let's say that we have, here's our timeline, and we're looking at uh, um, a certain number of, of uh, years. We're looking at three years. Here's, year, here's the end of year one. Here's the end of year two. And notice that it's quarterly. So we're looking at quarterly payments for three years. We'll get $3,000 at the end of every quarter for three years, and at the end of the term, we'll receive $20,000. So that's the cash flows that we're looking at is $3,000 a quarter for three years plus $20,000 and the discount rate is 8%. So the question then becomes is what is all of this worth today? Well, we don't want to take $3,000 and discount it by one period, then take three and discount it by two, then take three and discount. We don't want to do that. We want the easy way and here's the formula. But do you see a problem in here? And this is tricky, and most of the time, in reality, you'll be faced with this particular situation where we have a steady stream of cash flows, but then we have this curious thing hanging on the end. We have another 20. This formula is not set up to handle this 20,000. This only will tell you the present value of all of this $3,000 term. That's all it will do. So how are we going to handle that? Well, I'll show you how we handle that. So the first thing we want to do is let's fill in what we have here. Let's be very careful. We have 1 minus 1 over, what is our R in this case? Well, it's 8% a year, but we're doing it quarterly, which means it's 2% every quarter. That's the easy way to do it, and that's, that's a, an appropriate way to do it, is if it's 8% per annum, and we're compounding quarterly, we just take 8 divided by 4, we'll get 1 plus 0 0.002. And what is our n? Well, we have three years, and it's quarterly, so our n is 12. So this will be to the power of 12. So that's 1 plus 0 0.02 to the power of 12 over 0 0.02 times our payment. And what's our payment? 
three thousand dollars there we go so equals three thousand dollars but that is only the three thousand dollar cash flow and all we did was we just plugged the numbers into the formula that's it we still have to deal with this twenty thousand well plus all we do is we take twenty thousand dollars and we're discounting it backwards for the full period of time now this can be tricky listen to me I have seen students do this 1.083 discounting it back at 8% for the full three-year period do you see a problem there should it be 1.08 cubed or should it be 1.02 to the 12 because this is quarterly and that confuses students because they say, I can see the 3,000 quarterly because you're getting 3,000 every quarter, but you're not getting 20,000 every quarter. You're getting it way at the end of the period. Why would you discount it back at a quarterly rate? Well, you have to be consistent. One of the assumptions of the time value of money is that you can reinvest at the same rate, which means if we discount at 2%, what it's implicitly saying is the cash flow we receive on this day, we can invest somewhere else at 2% for the quarter. So to figure out what $20,000 is worth today, we need to know if we had so much money today and we invested for one quarter, and then one quarter, and then one quarter, and then one quarter, and so on, how much do we need today for it to grow to 20000 if we can reinvest at 2% per quarter, not 8% per year. You want to keep all your cash flows on the same, on the same uh, level. So it is the 1.02 to the 12. Make sure you stay consistent. That can be a big confusion. Now, are you going to be totally wrong? Well, no, not really. You're not going to be totally wrong. But what, what is going to happen is if you use 1.8 to the 3, you will be willing to pay more for this cash flow than if you used 1.02 to the 12. 1.0 to the 12 will make this cash flow worth less. So let's, uh, let's uh, uh, solve for uh, this problem. This term over here ends up being $31,726. This term over here ends up being $15,000. 770 we're adding them together so that equals 47,496 so you have to look at a problem like this and you and you have to be able to break it down into some parts and you have to say you know what I see an ordinary annuity there and I see a lump sum payment at the end of, of, of the period of time I see the assumption of reinvestment of, uh, of my cash flows it must be quarterly for both types of cash flow the annuity and the lump sum I'm ready to go. There you go. And that's really all it is, right?